I'm here at the uh, New Brunswick Health Emergency Operations Center. And I uh, just wanna draw attention to the, the room behind me. And I also wanna welcome Richard Ames, who's here with me this morning, I see. Um, all of these people behind me have been working diligently over COVID throughout our, um, our phases, throughout the circuit breakers, um, to make sure that all of the information throughout New Brunswick is brought here to one central location. I wanna say thank you to them because they, uh, they have been phenomenal. They have worked weekends, they have worked holidays, and, uh, and they really deserve our thanks uh, and praise for all of the work they've done. I am, uh, I've been on a journey the last couple of days to talk about the health plan. And as you know, it's been released in full this morning. So I hope you've been able to take a look at it. And I'm really, um, I'm really optimistic about the changes that we'll see, that New Brunswickers will see over the next 24 months that are really going to have an impact in how their health services are um, and how their health in progress. Are delivered. Erica Butler, join the meeting. Um, so I'm going to um, going to deliver some remarks today. It's all about technology, and I want to uh, I, I, I want to uh, to share with you some of the things that are happening now. When we first began to think about what our New Brunswick Provincial Health Plan should look like, we knew one of the overarching themes needed to be needed to be creating um, a connected system. Too many residents are getting lost and frustrated trying to navigate the many silos of our complex healthcare system. New Brunswickers deserve a more seamless experience, whether they need to access services that require referrals or they're underwearing tests for blood work and diagnostic imaging. This is why creating a connected system is one of the five action areas outlined in the new health plan titled Stabilizing Healthcare, an Urgent Call to Action. One way we will help New Brunswickers are uh, to be better connected will be to expand the services of My Health MD. This has been a great tool during the COVID-19 pandemic to provide people with access to vaccination and testing information. And over the next two years of this action plan, residents will be able to use My Health MD to access more information, such as lab results. The pandemic has also pushed us to introduce long overdue technologies. We will continue to leverage these learnings long after the pandemic is over. Just like New Brunswickers can schedule their COVID-19 vaccination online, they will finally be able to schedule their own diagnostic tests, such as blood work or x-rays. This will give people more control over when and where they receive their tests, helping to address transportation challenges, and make it easier for shift workers and families to plan around their busy schedules. Part of creating a connected system includes making improvements to the way people are transported in emergency situations or when they need to attend appointments in other regions of the province. To that end, Ambulance New Brunswick will reintroduce the emergency medical technician profession, helping to ensure more ambulances are on the road and lead to better response times. Over the course of the next two years, Ambulance New Brunswick's fleet will expand to include multi-patient vehicles. These vehicles will be used to increase non-emergency transfers for patients, resulting in a more timely service for people who are hospitalized or in long-term care who are waiting for a specialist appointment, diagnostic test, or necessary surgery in another part of the province. I'm especially pleased with this initiative. In every one of our 50 consultation sessions, transportation challenges were raised by participants, and I'm pleased to say that we are addressing this important part of the problem. We all know that recruiting health professionals is a serious challenge, especially in rural communities. A rural lifestyle has much to offer, and throughout the consultation process, communities expressed a desire to be part of the recruitment process. They want the chance to market their communities to potential new healthcare professionals. Today, we are inviting them to be our official partner in healthcare recruitment for, with everyone from, uh, for everyone for family doctors and nurses to psychologists and mental health counselors, as well as other health professionals. This will help rural communities develop promotional material and be part of our work to attract health professionals that they need. Another important lesson we have learned during the pandemic 
is that there are ways we can improve our laboratory services. This includes testing people closer to their homes, transporting specimens throughout the province quickly with an efficient turnaround time, and making results timelier by having them available online. We will build on these lessons to develop an integrated laboratory system. We plan to designate a New Brunswick lab as the provincial public health laboratory, ensuring residents experience a more standardized and streamlined process for sample collection, as well as more timely access to results. At the beginning of this pandemic, we were able, we were only able to process 300 tests per day. Now we're able to do 3000. Having a designated public health laboratory will allow it New Brunswick to better capitalize on opportunities with our federal partners and increase our ability to perform tests within our New Brunswick borders. Over the next two years, laboratories across the province will become part of an integrated clinical diagnostic and information system. Our laboratory information system is badly out of date, requiring wasteful steps, entering information and faxing uh, to our lab staff. It is in dire need of replacement because the number of medical laboratory technicians is decreasing with retirements and we must support them with smarter systems which work um, as we cannot replace them at the rate they are leaving the workforce. This will not change when New Brunswickers go to have their blood work done or where they drop off samples. Test results will still be delivered in a timely way and will be made available online. We know that our healthcare system faces additional challenges with connectivity. We rely on outdated technology like fax machines, and that is also a current concern we plan to address. Technology is one of the key enablers identified in the health plan. It will help address waste and inefficiency while also paving the way for a more integrated system for patients and providers. We will explore many new ways to incorporate technology in our health system over the next two years. Along with actions to empower citizens by providing them with their own information, we will explore the use of wearables and home-based monitoring technologies to support patients in their homes and help sen seniors age in place longer. Clinical decision support, support tools using artificial intelligence and robotic assisted surgeries will also be introduced. Partnerships will be built with small and medium-sized enterprises to leverage tried and tested solutions from around the world. We need a modern healthcare system that citizens can rely on to be there for them when they need it. We need a system that supports citizens in their quest to be healthy and manage their chronic conditions and enable health professionals to do their jobs in an effective way. Over the next two years, New Brunswickers will experience many tangible changes that will help create a connected system. Throughout the consultation process, I assured communities and health professionals that they would be part of our effort to make our health system stronger. And I look forward to working with them as we undertake these initiatives. Thank you, merci. Thank you, uh, Minister Shepard. Merci beaucoup, Minister Shepard. On va maintenant procéder aux périodes de questions. We will now proceed to question period. Each reporter will have one question. Chaque journaliste aura une question et peut poser la question dans la langue officielle de votre choix. You can pose your question in the official language of your choice. We're going to start this morning with Hadil Ibrahim with CBC. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Minister Shepard, you promised all topics and potential reforms will be on the table if the public demands it, including more private services, user fees, and increased access to abortion. Why were none of these mentioned in your plan? It became clear as we did our engagement sessions that there were some critical components of our healthcare system that needed to be addressed in order for us to stabilize the system. And so the first 24 months are the real focus of what we plan on doing to create the vision for our five-year plan of creating a network of excellence. And so these five um, focused areas, working with our enablers, 
are going to get us those changes that we need in order to stabilize our healthcare system. And as we're doing that, we'll continue to progress with the other initiatives within our, within our mandates. Thank you. Um, my follow-up is how will you lean on non-traditional providers like uh, chiropractors and life coaches and volunteers to fill the gaps without sacrificing the quality of medical care for people? Well, I think that's the whole point is that, you know, when, when, we, when we have our system set up and individuals need, need help, especially, you know, with our primary care network, when we achieve that, um, that, that, um, that list to be eliminated for people who are waiting for family physicians um, and know that we have them on a primary care network um, while they're waiting to get permanently placed, we're also going to be able to triage indivis individuals who need services. And we're gonna be able to um, uh, assess them um, over the phone or digitally, virtually, and then send them to the place that they need to go because maybe they just need to talk to a pharmacist. Maybe they just need um, massage therapy. Maybe they um, need physiotherapy. We need to utilize all of our um, all of our professionals to contribute. Let me also just say that it's really important that our RHAs and our, our healthcare system utilize community resources. We have so much in community that can contribute, licensed counseling therapists. Um, many community um, organizations can offer and bolster the healthcare system that we have, and I don't believe we're utilizing them to their full, uh, full potential. Thank you, Ms. Ibrahim. We're gonna to proceed to Jacques Poitra with CBC. Mr. Poitra. Sorry about that. Um, about recruitment, I'm wondering if this plan can work with the level of human resources in the system now, and if it can work with the level of human resources that you anticipate five years from now. Well, we've never um, we've never stopped recruiting, and recruitment and retention efforts are are ongoing. Um, we're going to be, um, you know, working with a, a new program with NBMS and our associations, making sure that they're in the loop, helping us to continue to go, uh, you know, even further than where we're at. It's important. We have medical students right here in our city or in our province. We have nursing students right here in our province. We need to be aggressive about um, ensuring that we get to keep them home. And, uh, and I believe that, you know, much of the negotiations that have just happened are going to be, um, are going to be helping us to that regard. But it is um, in no way, shape or form is recruitment and, and retention um, lower on the bar. It's just that we need to stabilize our healthcare system. And so that's why we have these five areas to focus on. Okay, my question was whether the system can work with, uh, the plan can work with the levels that exist now. But um, my, my other question is, um, is that, you know, last year, Gerald Richard said that tough decisions about small ERs couldn't be put off. Uh, John McGarry said you can't take ERs off the table because they keep putting themselves on the table. Uh, in 2014, Horizon and Vitalite said the number of ERs in the province was not clinically sustainable. So have you, like, why have you not made tougher decisions about some of these facilities? If we're going to truly embrace rural health care, we have to decide that we can work from a position from in a different direction. And in every other government, every other reform or plan has worked assuming that we have to go from one point I don't believe that. I've never believed that. And so if, if we truly want to create a network of excellence, we have got to decide what communities need and work from that point. And so I am determined to do that. And to your first question, do we have enough in the system? Uh, we have vacancies. We have to fill them. And our REJs are managing with what we have. We know we need more. But the REJs are in constant contact now. I'm proud of the way they're working together. And, um, and so we have what we have at this time. 
it, and, uh, and, and we'll continue on. Thank you, Mr. Poitra. Kevin Bissett with Canadian Press. Uh, Minister, uh, you talked about uh, bringing back the EMTs for Ambulance New Brunswick and uh, getting more ambulances on the road. How many more ambulances are we talking about? Well, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about, um, Tim. When, um, you know, it, um, ambulances carry, have two paramedics. And when one of those paramedics calls in sick, that typically, that truck is off the road for the shift. And the other ambulance attendant uh, spends their shift either um, redeployed if possible, or they stay in their, uh, they stay in, in, in their, um, um, a, a garage is a bad word for it, but they stay in the house. And so if we have EMTs that we can partner with paramedics, we ensure that that ambulance is going to be on the road. And you talk about uh, these new uh, multi-patient vehicles for non-emergency transfer. Uh, what are we talking about? These mini buses? What are they? Well, again, Ambulance New Brunswick is going to be bringing us back proposals and how we approach this. But we knew through all of these engagements, not just medical professionals or not just our citizens, but our medical professionals talked about the challenges of transportation throughout this province. And so we know that we have to address this in some way. This is a starting point. Ambulance New Brunswick is going to bring us back a plan as to how we can implement them and utilize them to the best. Uh, of, of our ability and, and utilize those resources towards getting people to their healthcare services and treatments. And then we will see how it evolves. But, you know, transportation in this province is a huge barrier, not just to healthcare, but it's, it's also a barrier to post-secondary education and employment. We need to find a way to, um, to have a strategy to help that. Thank you, Mr. Bissett. We're now going to proceed with Laura Brown from CTV. Hi, Minister. I'm wondering about the costing of this plan and if you've, you know, discussed that um, with, uh, with, with finance. Do you kind of have a blank slate? Can you spend as much as this plan needs? <laughs> the I guess I, I think about that question because I the, the amount of work that, that that staff have done to ensure that all of these um, initiatives are valid and attainable. And uh, and workable within uh, within healthcare budgets or or working with what we you know perceive to be our increases coming forward um, have all been validated. They went to great extent um, working with our RHA partners and working with um, uh, EMA and B uh, to ensure that we can uh, we can find ways to make things happen. Absolutely, some things are going to are going to need investment. We know that we're still going to need investment in long term care with regards to our. Um, you know, with regards to personal support workers and, uh, and attendants. So I think that um, we know as a government that as, uh, as we progress throughout time, budgets need to increase, healthcare cannot go down. I don't ever see that happening. And, uh, and, and we, we have 24 months to uh, implement our most, uh, our most top priorities. Ms. Brown, do you have a quick follow-up? Yeah, I, I think you tweeted this plan out on October 29th, assuming there's no there been no changes since that time. That was also around the time that the QP strike happened. I'm wondering if you're at all concerned about the delays in surgeries, you know, the cancel procedures that had to happen, et cetera, um, if that's going to delay any of these timelines that you've set out in this plan. For sure, but I, I think, um, you know, thanks to the great work with our, um, our people in the RHAs and here at the department, um, surgeries um, in New Brunswick have been, um, have been continuing to progress. Many provinces across this country lost the ability to do surgeries uh, during COVID. Here in New Brunswick, not only did we continue doing surgeries, we actually increased our capacity. Um, and at times we were 40% uh, more surgeries done than in 2019. Now that has wavered uh, with circuit breakers and, and obviously the strike um, had an impact on that. But in implementing the Surgical Advisory Committee, they helped us continue to keep surgeries moving. And that's why we're gonna be utilizing that same process throughout this province with other specialties in order to reach our objectives. We think we can do it and, and staff has validated it. Thank you. We're going to proceed to Natalie Sturgeon with Global TV. Thanks. Hi, Minister. Um, I'm just reading through the plan. It's a very ambitious timeline. I think within uh, two to three years. How realistic is that? Is that timeline? Well, as I've said earlier, um, 
we went to great lengths to put our objectives in place. This is about stabilizing the healthcare. New Brunswickers need to see that there are tangible changes that are going to impact the way they receive their healthcare services for the better. And so, um, you know, all the staff here at the department worked with our partners at the RHAs, extramural A and B, and they have validated all of our uh, initiatives and the timelines that go with it. Ms. Sturgeon, do you have a follow up? Yes, in 2020, um, I was in Sussex at the time and, and there were some major cuts coming to emergency rooms and I, in this plan there doesn't appear to be any of those, those harsh cuts, but what changed, what allowed you to, to say oh no we can keep them open. So we're going to be working with communities. Um, you know, one on one. And one of the things that I promised during our engagement sessions was that nothing's going to be done to communities, it's going to be done with them. And what we need to do is make sure we're addressing the needs in communities. So every single hospital has a role to play in this network. We can create a network of excellence. And by doing it together, we're going to, um, you know, we're hopefully going to avoid those hurdles where communities think they're losing things. So this is about creating this network of excellence with them. Thank you, Ms. Sturgeon. Thank you, Minister. On va maintenant procéder avec M. Alex Villeneuve de Radio-Canada. Bonjour. Euh, je vais faire une mise en situation concrète, si on peut dire quelques réponses concrètes, s'il vous plaît. Prenons un homme de la région de Bouctouche. Il souffre dans bon point, il veut se faire suivre pour le diabète, mais il n'y a pas de médecin de famille et donc il n'arrive pas à avoir de test ni de suivi sur son taux de glycémie. Concrètement, je voudrais comprendre les choses que ce monsieur va pouvoir faire dans deux ans et qu'il ne peut pas faire aujourd'hui. Quelles sont ces choses-là? Thank you for that example. So what's going to happen over the next several months? The primary care network is, is being established. And in that primary care network, this gentleman could call and, uh, and be referred to a clinic where he will then be seen by a, by, by a physician and that he will be assessed at that, at that conversation to understand if he needs to see someone the same day or if he's got a five to seven day window and that appointment will be booked for him. Depending on the needs, it could be virtual or in person. And so the clinic will be uh, in, in their area. And so it will, his, his records will be kept electronically so that if he has um, um, referrals and if he has follow-up, all of that information is stored for the same or next position to, uh, to pick up where they left off. And that's a transition until they get a permanent provider. Monsieur Villeneuve, as-tu un suivi? Oui, prenons une autre mise en situation. Prenons le cas d'une étudiante. Elle est jeune, elle souhaite être infirmière et elle compte rentrer en soins infirmiers dans deux ans à l'école de soins infirmières de Moncton. Concrètement, quelles étapes de moins est-ce que cette jeune femme va traverser avant d'entrer au travail? If I understand your, your question, um, the RHAs still have a hiring practice to follow, and that is defined by collective bargaining um, and the contracts. However, um, we need every single nurse that we can get in this province. And, um, and, and hopefully we have uh, vacancies in, in the communities they want to work, but they must go through collect the collective bargaining hiring process. Merci, Monsieur Villeneuve. We'll now proceed to Vicki Hogarth with CHCO-TV. Thank you, Bruce. Minister Shepard, walk-in mental health centers are part of New Brunswick's health care reform that are already underway. So can you give us an update on how they're progressing, if they're unfolding as planned, and how many New Brunswickers are using them at the moment? Well, thank you. Vicki, I don't have those numbers here today, but we will certainly get them for you. I can tell you that all 14 clinics are up and operating. They all were by the end of October. I think October 27th or 28th was the, was the day of the, the last one opening. And so um, they did a soft launch with working with their wait lists, and then they will be, uh, they will be completely open, um, I'm assuming, almost any day now uh, for, for taking those actual walk-in appointments. 
Um, and just as a follow up, uh, over the course of the pandemic, a uh, significant number of Canadians just in general have put off going to the hospital for health issues just out of fear of COVID or just being a burden on the system. Um, so something that could have been minor might potentially be much more serious in scope. So I'm wondering um, if you're anticipating a post pandemic surge in costs just due to the delay of healthcare cases that might now be more serious. We know that we have to expect more costs because let's just take the primary care network, for instance, um, access means Medicare billings. And so we are going to have increase in medical costs coming up over these next couple of years. And you're right, people, some people will have put off uh, dealing with, uh, with a health issue they may have um, for fear of not wanting to, uh, not wanting to go to the hospital or, or, or frequent too many, uh, too many physician offices. So um, I think that we, we have to expect that we're going to have higher costs. Thank you, Ms. Hogarth. We'll now proceed to Brad Perry with CHSJ St. John. Hi there, Minister Shepard. So, of course, this plan commits to accomplishing these priorities over the next couple of years, uh, which you have said will happen. So how will New Brunswickers know what is being achieved and, and where each of these priorities are over the coming weeks and months? So that's one of the reasons we have the implementation task force. And as I've said before, if we've learned anything from COVID, it's that when we have a directed focus on initiatives, Plans can happen very quickly. Um, changes can happen quickly. Um, um, initiatives can pivot to meet the needs of people in their communities and, and, and to get the results that we need in a timely fashion. And so the implementation task force will be reporting to myself and Minister Fitch. We have included timelines in the plan, as you've noted. Most of them run through four different quarters so that, um, uh, um, so that we can ensure that we have um, a timely um, measuring stick in order to know that these actions are getting, getting done. So are there any concerns at all, I guess, that, that you know, these, these two-year timelines, some may see these as quite lofty goals. Obviously, you know, it's, these are changes that need to happen in the healthcare system. Are there any concerns at all that maybe two years is just maybe too fast to implement all of these? Well, we had very, very rigorous um, validating processes through the staff, um, and uh, including, you know, our own deputy minister took it on to make sure that she uh, connected with all of her directors who have tentacles into the RHAs and EMA and B to ensure that what we were choosing to focus on in these 24 months was attainable. And so, um, People need to see that their healthcare system is going to be there for them when they need it. It's been a turbulent couple of years. I, I dare say it's been a turbulent decade for our healthcare system. And we need to attain these goals in order to see that, um, that network of excellence we're striving to achieve within the five years. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Andrew Watt runs with News. Minister, um, can you walk me through this this formal review of governance? I mean, is it possible that the you know the authority structure could change? Like I know during the first year of COVID, the pandemic task force had you know decision making power over the RHAs. Is it possible we could arrive back there, or or is that not on the table? Well, so what the the task force did during the pandemic was they they had um, they had authority to implement policy over both RHAs with regard to infection control and regard to how how the RHAs responded to the COVID reality. And the task force here, their goal is about ensuring that these initiatives are met in a timely fashion, getting the ex, uh, getting the expectation out there, and knowing that we're getting the outcomes we want. So I. Um, 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 uh, here's what I see happening because we have Vitalite, we have Horizon, we have EMA and B. That's not going to change. But what we need to see is a more seamless interaction between them. There's already a couple of initiatives in this plan that um, that speaks to that. And, and I'll, I'll go to the centralized referral system. Somebody needs a specialized service. And, uh, and maybe they can achieve it, not just in, the in another community, but maybe another health zone, you know, horizon to vitalite, vitalite to horizon. We need to make that seamless. And that's what the centralized referral processing system is gonna be about. And then I can also speak to the public health lab. 
one public health lab, which every province has, New Brunswick is the last to get one uh, designated public health lab, but that one public health lab will service both RHAs and EMA and B. Mr. Wall, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, so let's just, you know, I know you're not a fan of hypotheticals, but there's always the possibility that, you know, this vision, this plan that you laid out here, you know, someone's not on board with it or someone is, some group isn't getting stuff done. Um, what, besides reporting back to you, what authority, if any, does this task force have to say to that group, hey, you got to get this done. Like we're here to implement this. Will they actually be able to like order them to do it or do they report back to you and then you order them to do it? Well, I, I mean, you know, <laughs> these are two very uh, learned and esteemed individuals who know how to get things done. So, you know, do they have the authority of the minister? They have the authority of the minister behind them. And I expect that their directions are, are you know, are going to lead us to getting the, getting the elements done that we want. But Andrew, quite frankly, we have a system now that is working together. Um, and I've been told even recently in the last couple of days, better than people who have worked in this system for 40 years have ever seen. And so Horizon and Vitalite and Extramural ANB are all committed to making sure that we have uh, a healthcare system that is seamless and much easier for every single New Brunswicker to navigate. Thank you. Savannah Ott, Telegraph Journal. Hi, can you hear me? Just barely. Okay, uh, hopefully this is better. Yes. Um, one of the goals in your plan under mental health is to have um, adults high priority cases receiving service within 10 days. I'm wondering what kinds of workers are gonna, I guess, address those cases and will those services be, I guess, a triage within 10 days or would that be like the start of long-term therapy within 10 days? What does that look like? So it is receiving services. So by that point, we are expecting that triage to be, to be completed and individuals receiving services that they need and, and, and however they are determined that they're needed. The walking clinics are certainly going to help with that. Those with higher acuity of needs are going to be uh, you know, directed to, to, the, to, the, to the individuals that they need. But one of the ways that I know we can, better, we can do better, I spoke to it a little earlier, is we need to utilize resources within our community. Um, I can't tell you how often uh, in the short time I've been here that if I, I've asked for a new initiative, I get a report talking about new FTEs and how much budget it's going to take. And I, I almost always go back and say, have you checked in community to see if this is being done anywhere? It's just that culture, right? The, we, we have people operating in their silos and we're breaking that out. We need to utilize community resources who can come to the table and deliver excellent services to us so that we can uh, do more uh, with what we have. Yes, do you have a follow-up today? Thank you, Bruce. Um, and sort of on that note of using what we have, um, the Child and Youth Advocate found in its mental health review that um, a lot of people who youth interact with during crisis um, or when they seek help, they aren't actually adequately trained to meet those needs. Um, so I guess, what does this plan do to make sure the people who um, these youth are seeking help with are actually getting that training so the services are effective? Right, so you'll remember the launch of our interdepartmental uh, five-year uh, mental Health and Addictions Action Plan, which we then um, fast track to a three year plan. And then because of, um, you know, because of a couple of reports that came immediately after that due to some tragic circumstances in our communities, we have been able to ensure that all frontline workers are being exposed to trauma informed care. It is pivotal. Um, we, are, we are changing uh, some of the methods used at our ER departments and the processes and protocols there. And, um, and that needs to continue on. We're uh, making training available to our first responders. This is all part of uh, initiatives that will be growing over the next uh, you know, um, six to 24 months to ensure that we have um, the best approach that we can. You know, it's, it's daunting. 
but we have a number of people who have come to the table with leadership on this and uh, we've made progress already and that's going to continue. We'll now go to Miriam Lafontaine of CBC with CBC. Hello, uh, Ms. Shepard. I was wondering, um, the health care plan did mention some issues um, with re recruitment and retention and some s possible solutions. I wanted to know, um, is there an intention right now to increase the number of uh, training opportunities for students uh, to help deal with the shortage of health care workers in the province? You know, I've met this week not only with uh, University de Moncton Sherbrooke medical students and uh, uh, University of New Brunswick Dell Med students uh, in St. John in Moncton, and um, and and I have to tell you that we have some tremendous uh, tremendous young young New Brunswickers uh, who really want to stay in this province. So I think that our recruitment efforts need to be uh, need to be uh, accelerated. We need to have these partnerships with the medical society and with our all of our association, the nurses association. And um, I can only say that Minister Holder and I are uh, in in frequent talks to try to understand how we can improve uh, the number of students that we have, what's possible, and, uh, and we're certainly going to, um, going to continue to have those discussions and hopefully, you know, in, in, in maybe by next budget, we'll be able to come out with some uh, new news. All right, thank you. And um, as a follow-up, um, are there any particular training opportunities that you think need to be prioritized, for example, with nursing students or uh, certification for medical specialties or emergency medicine? Well, the emergency medical technicians is going to be reintroduced. So that is education that needs to be reintroduced in our province if we're going to do that effectively. Um, so we're going to be talking with our post-secondary um, uh, institutions for that, NBCC and CISAMB. And, uh, and, and, you know, we, we just need to try to uh, try to be able to afford as many seats as possible in all of these. But you know, a hospital is a big employer, and they need all kinds. And um, you know, we're going to lose forty percent of our lab technicians over the next five years. That's an enormous number. We believe that the connectivity that we're going to do with our lab system is going to help us with that, and that's why it's so important that we do it. But you know, a hospital has many different components to it, not just nurses and doctors, and we desperately need those, just like every other province in all of Canada. But we also need to uh, need to make other positions attractive as well. Thank you. We're going to go. On va maintenant procéder avec Monsieur Alexandre Boudreau de la Tête des Nouvelles. Monsieur Boudreau. Madame la Ministre, est-ce que vous m'entendez? Oui. We can. Um, Pouvez-vous me parler un peu de combien tout ceci va coûter? Yes. Uh, euh, J'ai écouté votre, votre réponse à la question de Laura, mais euh, je me demande si vous pouvez mettre un chiffre sur les changements que vous, vous préparez pour les deux prochaines années. Euh, je sais que le, le, le budget pour la santé va probablement augmenter, mais, mais de combien euh, exactement? Well, those numbers are still being worked out. Um, um, and, and as always, we will come forward with, uh, you know, with our operational budgets come the come uh, come the spring and and so no I cannot tie um, an actual figure to all of this because some of it is still in development the primary care network um, the IT that needs to go with that that is still in development and um, you know un until we we actually start implementing the plan and understanding what it's going to do then it will be about choosing priorities we have uh, said that these are our priorities. We need a stabilized healthcare system, and they will have. Erica Butler, join the meeting. Je peux te voir, tu es suivi. Oui, est-ce qu'elle avait fini sa réponse? Okay. Um, donc, ma prochaine question est sur uh, la, la formation de soins cliniques. Uh, vous voulez avoir des programmes de formation plus courts puis accélérer la reconnaissance des qualifications des professionnels de la santé qui ont été formés à l'étranger. Um, il me semble que j'ai entendu le gouvernement dire la même chose il y a une couple d'années. That's been a challenge um, that certainly yeah, I've, 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 um, I've been frustrated um, by this also, past year. Um, been, we, sorry. again, are going to be working with our associations. Most of the medical professionals are self-regulated. And so we need to work with those medical, uh, those medical professions in order to help us understand if we can find a way. There's some conversation, actually, about 
um, looking at the programs in other countries and validating those programs um, first, so that when we know that a graduate has come through those programs, the process is much easier. So that is still a, a work in progress. It's, um, it's being worked on aggressively, and uh, hopefully we'll have more news on that uh, in the early new year. Okay, so, but, but, yeah, actually, okay, thanks. Okay. Sir Pascal Vachnot, Radio Canada. Oui, bonjour, euh, Madame Shepard. Dans votre plan, vous dites que vous voulez réduire la durée de certains programmes de formation post-secondaire pour les professionnels de la santé. Euh, J'aimerais savoir quel programme et euh, qu'est-ce que ça va être comme changement concrètement. Um, the the uh, the dean the dean certainly told us about different options that students have in order to um, to take a path that might eliminate one or year of practice in favor of experiential learning. So it's really um, those kind of uh, initiatives. We hope we can we, we can help move things faster. Whenever we make decisions and, and changes in training, we need to do that in hand in hand with our professional organizations. And so um, you know the EMT training will come back to our to our uh, to our community colleges. We're going to work with the paramedic association on that to ensure that it's done right and properly and how we can get them trained as quickly as possible. Um, so this is still a work in progress and we'll be bringing back those initiatives with outlined detailed plans from not only the task force, but from the associations that we work with. Et ma question suivie, c'est sur la liste d'attente pour euh, les patients en attente d'un médecin de famille. Euh, vous dites que vous voulez euh, éliminer la liste d'ici deux ans. Est-ce que ça veut dire que votre objectif, c'est que d'ici deux ans, tous les néo brunswickois qui le souhaitent aient un médecin de famille? So what we're referring to there is that the, the patient connect list will actually be eliminated within the next 12 months. Um, all of the individuals who are waiting for a permanent primary care provider will be able to access uh, a physician at a clinic and uh, they'll, be, they'll be triaged when they call for appointments and they'll be assigned, um, they will be assigned a, a medical provider either by virtual or in person uh, as that assessment deems. And so what it will do is it will ensure that anyone who is waiting for a permanent provider is not denied access to primary health care. Everyone on Patient Connect will have access to a primary care provider within the next year. Oui, bonjour. Bonjour, merci Bruce et good morning, Minister. Euh, ma question, c'est sur les dédoublements de services. Le premier ministre a beaucoup insisté sur l'élimination des, des dédoublements de services spécialisés. Euh, J'aimerais savoir qu'est-ce qui va être fait à ce niveau-là, Madame la ministre. So I think what we're what we're referring to is the connectivity that we're talking about. So um, it's really important that people can can receive the services they need um, as soon as they can have it. And so that's what the connectivity is all about with the centralized referral process. And overlaps, well, that's what we bring to community. Um, you know, if, if, if some communities need some services more than others, then maybe there's opportunity there for us to, to rest and move things around so that those services are, um, are accessed and specialists are busier at other locations, um, you know, every every single doctor wants to practice to full scope, um, and whether they're um, whether they're a, um, an X-ray technician or whether they are a physician, everyone wants to be uh, to be utilizing their time well. So, as I've made, mentioned before, this is all about doing things with community, not to community. And so, we believe that there are any if, if any changes must happen in any area. Is going to be discussed with the medical professionals in that area and the community. Okay, alors si je comprends bien, on n'a pas vraiment avancé sur ce côté-là. Euh, C'est encore au niveau des discussions. 
sur la question de fusion de services entre Vitalité et Horizon, où est-ce qu'on en est? Est-ce que c'est encore en termes de discussion ou s'il y a des choses qui, qui, qui vont être faites? Well, as I mentioned before, Horizon and Vitalité are, are, are collaborating and communicating like never before. And they all want the very best for the system that serves people. So as Horizon and Vitalité go forward and have discussions, you know, they might find ways to, um, you know, uh, to, to move services from one area to another. That makes perfect sense. And so this is all about, all about defining with community what their needs are and how we meet them. It is about creating that network of excellence that I believe is achievable. And I believe we can do it with Vitalité, Horizon, and Exterior Andy. Hi there. Um, my question is, uh, if there's any concerns about um, maintaining services in um, smaller ERs and rural hospitals um, while obtaining these objectives uh, within the uh, healthcare plan. So they've always been a concern, Sarah, and that's why we have to give the RHA some latitude when they need to make temporary measure, take temporary measures in order to ensure a safe and a safe work environment, not just for the patients, but also for the teams. And so as our recruitment and retention efforts go forward, and as we look at services that are provided, we, um, you know, our goal is to ensure that we can, we can um, resource the services that we have. So that's part of the conversation. And uh, my follow-up question is um, regarding the EMTs. I was just wondering what their role would be and kind of what their scope of practice is compared to a paramedic or um, advanced care paramedic. So an EMT has less, uh, has a, <clears throat> excuse me, less of a clinical component, um, and they're going to be there to assess paramedics or advanced care paramedics in the jobs that they do. But the other thing that they might be able to do is also to transport um, non-critical patients from one facility to another, or even those who who uh, who need transportation uh, to, you know, from a hospital back to their home environment. We'll now go to Timothy Jakes. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, my question is uh, in, your, in your plan, uh, you, you said uh, for Q1 for 22-23 additional beds will open in Camelton for individuals who need treatment for their mental illness and a substance use disorder. Uh, are, are these in the new addiction center that's going in the building originally meant for the youth psych center? And uh, are these beds in addition to, uh, I think it was 24 beds previously announced, or are they the same 24 beds? If they're new, how many? If I'm not mistaken, they are the same 24 beds. It's just that we'll be progressing with the opening. Okay. When will it open? Um, <laughs> early in the new year, you want to do anything? I'm okay. sorry, I don't have the plan open in front of me, um, so I don't have those. But if it, we put it in the plan with deadlines, measures, and targets, and uh, and that's what we'll be doing. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Jakes, did you have a follow up? Uh, yes, I, I, I guess my follow up would be uh, given the uh, human resources issues here in Zone 5. 
uh, how will you ensure there'll be enough, uh, enough staff to uh, look after these beds? Uh, because particularly in zone five. Well, and again, that's why we've given it um, a bracket of time so that we can, uh, we can build up our resources and ensure that we, we be prepared. That's part of our recruitment strategy has been all along. Thank you. Erica Butler, CHMA, Sackville. Hi there. Um, I heard some uh, one local uh, doctor here wondering about, um, in terms of primary care, um, I guess there's some cynicism about the 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 new um, the new network and how it will work. Um, he was wondering about um, the uh, agreement, the, the new model of family practice agreed to um, between the government and the New Brunswick Medical Society. Um, about you know seven to nine years ago uh, that would have family doctors working in groups um, to provide on-call service to provide that extra service for people without assigned doctors mm -hmm. um, is is I, I guess the question is um, uh, there's people that are concerned that um, that the past plans haven't worked out will how 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 are you tackling this in a different way we're attacking this in a different way because what we got, um, what we collaborated with the New Brunswick Medical Society on was getting, um, getting the hours of, um, of operation that we need committed from New Brunswick Medical Society physicians. And so they have committed to giving us a certain number of hours that, would, uh, that we know will, will take care of the patient connect list. And then the, the province of, of New Brunswick will be, um, will be setting up the electronic medical records and there will be an administrative system in place by MediB, which will, which will book the patients and, uh, and book the doctors. And so this is going to be quite a seamless effort for physicians and for patients alike. And I believe it's going to be transformational not only to our healthcare system, I believe other provinces may follow. And I also think that um, it's going to be very attractive for physicians to sign on to. That doesn't take away the fact that we have wonderful family medicine practices and family physicians working in their offices and, um, and we wanna support them. So as this, uh, as this progresses, all of these hours have come voluntarily from the New Brunswick Medical Society. We're not taking away from anything. And so that's why we think it's successful because we've taken a lot of the complication out of it and made it easy for them to participate. Sorry, I was just wondering if there was, um, uh, is, is there an estimate on what the cost will be uh, for the administrative part of the primary care network, and uh, and I guess also the cost of the the additional billable hours that that the province might see. Do you, do you have a ballpark on that? I don't have that number with me, but of course those estimates have been done because we know how many you know how many individuals, and we know approximately you know two to three visits per year. So we know that there's going to certainly be an increase to Medicare um, and Medicare billings as that progresses. And um, the contract details are being worked out with MediB, and uh, we're we're working on that through uh, through, through through getting the system um, uh, final proposals done, and then we'll be proceeding, and I'll be able to give you those figures at that time. Uh, we're going to go to Bruce Ward with New York Times in Sackville. Yes, hello, thank you. Hope you can hear me. We can. We uh, in Sackville have um, been suffering from uh, closures of the uh, ER overnight um, because of the shortage of, of medical staff. And so with the large student population here at Mount A, um, there has been a problem because Moncton is a long way away from here uh, if you're a student without a car uh, to access the ER services. So I'm wondering um, how things will change in Sackville where we've had progressively more and more closures of the ER, particularly overnight on weekends. Um, how are we going to see a change there uh, in the near future? 
So one of the things we need to do is use our ERs differently. And that is what this plan is all about. We need to support people in when before they even need the ER um, or as an alternative to the ER. And that's what the primary care network is about. That's why we need to have individuals not only working with the primary care network for preventative measures, but also for non-urgent issues that come up with students, with the community, so that they don't have to use the emergency room. We still, um, you know, we still foresee this as being temporary. We're working on, of course, in our recruitment strategies, but the, the, the RHAs need to manage <clears throat> these situations for the safety of not just patients, but also medical professionals. But the, the idea is, is that when EMAND um, have resources in place, um, and policies that we're discussing about treatment release with follow-ups from extramural, we have tools in our toolbox to divert people from the ER, and we need to be using those to a maximum. And that's, um, <clears throat> that's going to be part of this ongoing process. And a follow-up question uh, concerns lab services. Um, as I understand it, you're going to maintain local lab services everywhere, even though there will be uh, some kind of centralized facility uh, to streamline the process. So the lab services, the blood work that we have here in Sackville will uh, continue, as I understand it, if I'm right. Every hospital needs a certain capacity of lab services, and those, the, those uh, you know, every hospital will have lab services to meet their capacity needs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Ladies and gentlemen, Madame Zimmerstead actually closed today's news conference.